What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Sit Down, a crime history podcast presented by Barstool Sports. I'm your host, Jeff Nato, and we are back and better than ever. Another week, another episode, another sit down. And I got to tell you, I'm very excited about this one. There are questions I get all the time on the mafia. One question I get a lot is about the Gotti family. What do we know about the Gotti family outside of John Sr. and John Jr.? Those are the ones we hear about all the time. But what about the other five brothers that John Gotti had? We're going to talk about them today, how many of them were involved with the mafia. And we're going to also talk about one brother that very few people know exist. So we got a lot to get into today on the show. As always, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button and make sure you hit the like button. Uh, so you never miss a sit-down video. If you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, welcome in. Hope you enjoy the show. Make sure you leave me a detailed review and let you let me know what you think of the show. We got a great guest today, and I'm looking forward to this one. I get questions all the time about where is Black Jack Fletcher? What happened to Black Jack Fletcher? What's he been up to? We're going to bring him back today. Our old host, Black Jack Fletcher did, I don't know, probably – 30 or 40 episodes of this show, basically half of them because... Oh, shit, man. It was more than that. I did the first year with you. Yeah. Well, I guess we're up into like the 80s at this point. So you probably did, what, 50 shows, I would think. Yeah, brother. Yeah. Uh, it's our old friend, Blackjack Fletcher. Blackjack, people ask me all the time about what's going on with you. It's good to see you back. I told them, well, he'll probably be on at some point and we'll do a show. Uh, what's been up with you? What's up? What's good? Yeah, man. Just, you know, running my thing over here at BTV. Give us a follow at BTV Bets. Um, you know, we, uh, we got a lot of stuff going on uh, in the world of gambling. So if you're into, into some gambling content, check us out. Um, you know, obviously nothing like what, what you guys got going there. But, you know, doing my thing, brother, doing my thing. And it's funny because I'm sure there'll be plenty of people that watch this and say, holy shit, there's the cowboy. He's back. <laughs> That's and, right, man. Uh, you know, obviously people know you from Barstool. They know you from being on this show. <laughs> Uh, but the good thing about this show is we always had a great rapport, you and I. And I think one of the best shows we ever did was probably the show on John Gotti Sr. I and mean, that was a very early episode that we did. Uh, and I thought it'd be good to get you back on this show because the Gotti legacy really outside of John Sr. is not a good one, really. Um, a lot of the brothers and family members that Gotti had involved with the life outside of himself uh, were quite frankly pretty stupid um, they all had kind of issues uh, if you will and what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of delve into the lives of all of them some of them have very brief times in the mafia like Gene Gotti who I think probably had the most ceiling if you will but he went to jail so early in his career that really don't know much but you know the Gotti name blackjack is kind of synonymous with John Sr. but there were four other brothers that were in the mafia yeah, I mean, listen, when you talk about the Gotti family, and, and obviously we did our episode on John pretty early uh, in the sit down, but, you know, you've got his brothers, obviously, his son was involved. I mean, this was a family affair for the Gottis, kind of kind of top to bottom. So it's, it's interesting to, to get to do a show on really the brothers, because usually they're just talked about as kind of, you know, ancillary characters when you're talking about John. They're actually pretty interesting, though, because the one thing we have to know about Peter is he would ultimately he was the oldest brother. He would ultimately become the boss of this family in the early 2000s. So we'll get into all that and more. Before we do that, though, Black Chick, there are probably people that don't know who you are. Um, tell kind of people why you were on this show to begin with. Tell, tell them about kind of your previous life a little bit. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, you and I have known each other for a long time now uh, through the sports gambling world. But uh, I was a criminal defense attorney for eight years uh, down here in Florida. Uh, still, I'm a licensed attorney, but I, I had a I practiced criminal defense for for eight years. So I've got a kind of a unique lens into the organized crime world. Yeah, you did a lot in, in the different systems, and you, you always provided a good kind of legal uh, kind of side of the show as well so it's good to have you back uh, we'll have to make it a little bit more frequent but uh let's get into it we're going to talk about the Gotti brothers we're going to kind of go chronologically John was born in 1940 he was the second oldest brother uh, the oldest brother though was Peter Gotti Peter Gotti was born October 1939 and you know the one funny thing that I found about all three out of the four Gotti brothers with the exception of Gene and John they all maintained legitimate jobs for a period of time. Peter Gotti would actually start his career 
working in the New York sanitation department, which is kind of interesting. Uh, he was a garbage worker in, in New York City. Now, that's a lofty job. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's a civil service job. It's a trade, if you will. It's a pay union well. job. Yeah, they pay well. Yeah, right. That's all the, the trades in New York, whether you're a, you know, a construction worker or a cop or a fireman or a sanitation worker. There is money in all this stuff. Now, it was a very dirty job, as we know, and you're dealing with rats and roaches and garbage. But you know, he tried to maintain legit employment. It was probably difficult, though, I'm sure, to wake up every day and think, wow, you know, my other brother, uh, John, he's, you know, moving around in the 70s. He's becoming this big, bad gangster. Um, but I think initially it's probably like, well, I don't want to go to jail either. So I'll just kind of try to do this for a while. That would probably be pretty difficult, though, to go to family functions and be like, oh, what are you up to today? You know, oh, I went and collected garbage. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine how that's got to feel like you spend, you know, 12 hours a day picking up trash in, and in New York City, too. Right. This isn't trash in Topeka, Kansas. This is New York City trash. It's the worst trash of the worst. Um, you're doing that all day and then you show up and, and Johnny shows up in a two thousand dollar suit and a hand painted tie and that beautiful mane of hair that he had. Yes. And you probably you probably do a lot of thinking. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what happened. And the stars kind of aligned for all that to happen. But it's funny you mentioned garbage because I was in New York yesterday, right? And I was I parked usually I usually park a park on 30th and 8th, which is mm -hmm. kind of somewhat close to uh the Barstow offices on 28th and 7th. And you know, in, it's a disgusting city, man. It really <laughs> is. I mean, it just makes you feel dirty, man. You get out of your car and it's just like, yuck, man. This is a, a disgusting place. I mean, there's literally always trash everywhere. Um, it's just, it's filthy. It's a filthy place. And, and it's not even bad this time of year in the summer. It just smells of garbage. Oh, sure, sure, sure. It's just, it, it has to be the dirtiest place on the planet. I mean, surely. Certainly in the United States. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's probably not worse than I'm sure like Mumbai is really dirty and like different places. But, you know, New York is filthy. Uh, so Peter Gotti was this sanitation worker. And then in 1979, things kind of happened randomly. He would fall off the back of a truck, if you will, hit his head a little bit, got injured. And in 1979, he would take a basically a, a payoff uh, to leave and collected his pension and got disability. So he was making his pay still, but he was on disability. So he didn't have a job. He was still making income, but this is where his connection to organized crime would start. He would begin hanging around the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, which, you know, it's funny when you hear people describe Peter because they describe him as this. And if you've ever seen him speak, I, I've heard him talk on many occasions. He's kind of like a jovial character. You know, he's, hey, hey how you doing? You know, it's. I, I saw him at one point uh, buy – he would attempt to buy ice cream for uh, federal um, uh, <laughs> FBI people that were surveilling them. You know, he's, yeah. he, he was a quacky guy. I remember Mad TV sent this clown one time to the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club to deliver balloons to John Gotti, and he accepted the balloons. It, it was a very random thing. It's He was kind of a jovial guy, so he starts hanging around the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, kind of acts as a driver, coffee guy, you know, has some – odds and outs with gambling and shit like that. Um, but he would begin to start to get more and more of a role inside the Bergen crew. And as John's kind of coming up in the eighties, blackjack, we remember John was the capo of that crew. Eventually John takes on the upper echelon roles in the eighties. Gene, which we'll talk about gets arrested by the late eighties. John Gotti gives the control of the Bergen crew to Peter Gotti by this point. So Peter goes from being a sanitation worker to disability collector to a cop on a Gambino crime family. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a hell of a rise when you think about it. But, I mean, it makes all the sense in the world, right? I mean, John Gotti was a guy who, you know, he didn't suffer from the paranoia that that a lot of guys did. But, you know, he liked to, he liked to control his his people. And who better to control than Peter? I mean, Peter was eminently controllable. He's going to do what John tells him to do, period. Not only is he his brother, but as we talked about, not the sharpest tool in the shed. No, he definitely wasn't. Um, and it's interesting because his name would actually pop up in 1990 in the very famous Windows case. Now, mm -hmm. 
the Windows case had to do with all the families. And basically what it centered around was in the late 80s, the New York Housing Authority decided to reinstall windows in the 330 New York housing projects that they have in all the boroughs. And the mob was able to basically fix the contracts and collect like $2 on every window installed. So think about how many windows. There are 330 buildings. I mean, there are hundreds of windows in each unit and you're making $2 and you're basically deciding on how much you can charge. What we would find out is in the windows indictment, every family had a liaison, if you will. Okay. Mm -hmm. So whether it was Benny Eggsman gone and the Genovese family or Peter Gotti. Now, the one interesting thing about the windows case is most of the defendants would be convicted. Peter Gotti would beat the rap in the windows case. There was not enough information to bring him to justice on it. Now, whether he was involved or not, I don't know if he was smart enough to be directly involved with this. Now, did he collect some payments and things like that? Yeah, right, right. Probably. But this is when we really see Peter Gotti's name pop up as a very interesting liaison. I mean, there were some high ranking people. I mean, Chin Giganti was indicted in that case. Um, it was a pretty big case. That's a huge undertaking, Black You figure, let's just say there are 500 windows, which there aren't, there are more than that in each. I mean, more. that's. That's a huge amount of windows in, in each. It's, uh, we talked about it. We did an episode where we talked a lot about the, the windows case. And it's just, I remember we, we said it's like the classic example of pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Like the level of greed involved in that one is shocking. Like you just thought you were going to get away with scamming every window in New York City. At some point, that's going to catch up to you. I mean, you figure... Let, let's just think of it like this. I mean, if if there are 330 housing projects and each one has a thousand windows in it, okay, that's 330,000 windows times two dollars a window. I mean, I mean it, it's, in it's each way, window. you know what I mean? Like they were they were just the the because we talked about the numbers on that case and it was stupid. I mean, it, it's it really is one of those things that like. You, you look back on you're like, did you did you really think that one was going to fly? Yeah, and, and look, that's what the mob did. I mean, they were in control of every construction project that went on, whether it's the Javits Center or the concrete or the or whatever steel, mm -hmm. whatever they controlled everything. So, yeah. you know, he's involved with that. This Windows case, he gets off though and beats the rap. Okay. Ultimately, we would find more about Peter Gotti out in the late 90s and early 2000s. By this point, let's just say in 1998, the government is starting to come down hard on Junior Gotti, the son of John Gotti, who's now in control of the family. Senior is in jail. He's gone. OK, so Junior's locked up. Peter's named acting boss in the early 2000s. But I want to talk before about what Peter was involved in as the liaison of John in prison. If you've ever seen the prison videos, John Sr. is regularly visited by Peter. In fact, at one point, he is literally there every time they speak. And he brings the family to see him. And at one point, Gotti tells him, don't bring them here anymore. I don't want to see him anymore. Um, it, it almost seemed like he was kind of sick of them after a while. But we would learn a lot about John through his prison consultations with his brother, at one point, we would find out some very interesting news about our friend Sammy Gravano. And as we know, John makes a comment to Peter at one point and basically says, we have a debt that needs to still be paid. And it's Gravano. So that's code. Hey, get it done. Get rid of him. So Peter instructs a guy, Huck Carbonaro, who used to be in Sammy's crew, to go kill Gravano. Now, remember, Gravano is a active informant rat who is being protected by the government. So they're attempting to kill an active rat, which isn't a smart idea, to be honest. <laughs> Probably Huck not. Carbonara, Huck Carbonara enlists this, this young tech whiz called Sa Fat Sal Mangiavellano, who um, had a way with computers and things like that. And they thought we can kind of figure it out. We'll, we'll kind of, maybe rig a bomb or something and blow it up. And they attempted to kill him multiple times. It never worked. They were never able to get to Sammy Gravano. And when I interviewed Sammy, I, I asked him about that. Um, ultimately, this would actually come back to bite Peter Gotti because this is what ultimately would put him away forever. Um, but he would be named boss. 
And it was a long road from the days of sitting on the back of a garbage truck. I actually wanted to kind of bring up some of the things that I found on Peter Gotti. There were always great quotes about Peter. And, and many of the quotes I would find is he was a nice guy. Maybe he was worthy enough to be like a capo, but he did not have the boss like no. feel to him. He had no managerial skills. Uh, he was just a dumb kind of oaf, if you will, kind of an ogre. That's kind of what he was. Um, it's kind of wild to think that at one point, Carla Gambino was in control of the Gambino family blackjack. And in the early 2000s, it was Peter Gotti. Yeah, man. I mean, the, uh, the, the decline was pretty swift. I mean, like you said, you go from Carlo Gambino, one of the all time figures in the history of organized crime to Paul Castellano. Okay. John Gotti. That was a roller coaster. And then since then, it's just been, it's been a shit show. Yeah, it really was. And for Peter, he would essentially in 2003 be convicted after being arrested in 02. And he would eventually get arrested for the, the Sammy Gravano attempted hit. But he would first have to go to jail for extortion and racketeering and all that stuff. And this would stem from a waterfront case that the feds would bring against the Gambino crime family. There are multiple people that were in control of the Brooklyn waterfront. They controlled the International Longshoremen Association. They were controlling different funds, healthcare funds, and, and basically skimming them. Um, and this would lead to a huge indictment involving not only Peter Gotti, but high ranking members of the family, including another one of his brothers, which we'll get into. But it would center around them just kind of having control of the waterfront. And one of the brothers was used as liaison between Peter and this other guy. And this would jam Peter up. That would though only give him 112 months that case. In 2004, though, he would be convicted in a separate trial. And in July 2005, got 25 years. And this would stem from the attempted hit he put out on Sammy Gravano. Now, Peter Gotti would sit in prison for a long period of time. He would attempt to get compassionate release three different times. Judge would never budge. They're not budging on letting a Gotti guy out. No way. No no yeah, no shot. Uh, and in February of 2021, Peter Gotti would die at the age of 81. He had a lot of health problems. Um, I know his uh, longtime girlfriend tried to, you know, get justice for him and get him out because he had gout and kidney disease and all this stuff. Um, as I said, you know, Peter Gotti was a jovial guy from what I've noticed, you know, and anyone that knew him said he's a nice guy, you know, real good guy to be around. You know, he was a fun guy for sure, but he did not have the capability to be a boss. And again, that's something we learned about pretty much everyone associated with the family outside of John. None of them had the qualities that he had. Now, John had some shortcomings, but he didn't have the shortcomings that Peter had at all. No, no. I mean, John's uh, we've talked ad, ad nauseum about John's shortcomings. And, what you know, when you talk about guys like Peter and, and kind of the trajectory of the Gambino crime family, it, it to me, one of the most fascinating questions in all of organized crime is what does the Gambino family look like if John Gotti never hits Paul Castellano? Like if Paul Castellano is just the boss and John Gotti's just a regular guy, he's just a capo running a crew. And that's, that's what he is. Like, what does that family look like today? Because John Gotti was the, the spark plug for so much of, of the, the law enforcement effort that went into it so much of, he was a catalyst for the, the change that those families underwent. Like it just, it's kind of fascinating to me, like to think about what happens if not for John Gotti. It's funny. I, I would actually read a pretty interesting quote that an unnamed old soldier had about Peter Gotti. And this comes from a New York Magazine article. He would say about Peter Gotti, quote, he was just a bag man, a tree jewel, if you know, if you know what that means. A tree jewel is a, a, a dopey kind of guy, right? Like a, like a, yeah, a no good kind of guy. He would also say that no one could, you know, no one could really trust him. He was just kind of a weird kind of guy. And at one point, John said uh, about his brother, if it doesn't have to do with our mother or father, stay away from me, he famously told Pete 
on a bugged FBI tape, also referring to him as a moron. Um, so, I mean, but it is important to realize John Gotti talked about everybody negatively. So, yeah, with right. calls you a moron, it's <laughs> it's just how he talks. Yeah, it's just how it goes. Um, I want to get into the second brother. Remember, we talked about Peter, born in 1939. John's born in 1940. The third brother that was born was in 1942, was a guy called Richard Vito Gotti. That was the third brother. He, like his brother Peter, attempted to go into legitimate work. Now, we remember the Gotti family in the early 50s moved from the Bronx to East New York. So Richard, Vinny, and some of the other brothers were the ones that would grow up directly in East New York, Gene as well. Richard Gotti's kind of interesting because in his early 20s, he maintained legitimate work as well. He would allegedly work as a grounds crew uh, employee at Yankee Stadium. Kind of an interesting uh, job. He also would manage a social club called the Our Friends Club in Ozone Park. Now, he would become uh, pretty involved in some of the normal mob rackets. But if you remember what I said before about the whole kicking up at the waterfront, Richard Gotti acted as the intermediary between Peter Gotti and a guy called Sonny Chacon. Chacon was this big, prominent gangster who was on the waterfront in Brooklyn, made a whole lot of money. Um, this guy, Richard Gotti, would actually take over the old Peter Gotti crew, which was the Bergen crew, in uh, 2002. So he would take over the family at one point after – uh, you know, everyone else makes their moves up. So kind of an interesting story. He goes from Black Chick being a, a baseball groundskeeper to kind of maintaining a, you know, hey, I'm going to go home after work and have a social club and maybe I move a couple loans around or whatever. And I always have one, I always have one foot in the streets because my brothers are the Gotti. Yeah, I mean, listen, I was going to say when you said the name of the social club was the Our Friends Social Club. I got a hard time believing that's 100% legit, but, you know. Right, right. And they'll make it seem like all, all we're doing here is playing Pinochle and having pasta. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. It was it's, more than that. Um, now, like Richard said, got everyone moves up, he moves up. And now yes. he fills that role. And again, if you're John, who better to fill it than your brother? Exactly. Now, he would be jammed up in that same 2002 case with Peter Gotti and with Sonny Chacon and all these different guys. Now I bring this case up as well because it, it's directly involving two of the Gotti brothers, but Black Chick, I don't know if you've ever heard about the attempted extortion of Steven Seagal. Yeah, you're burying, I was going to say you're burying the lead here. It's Steven. Yeah. Steven Seagal, Mr. Tough guy, Mr. Seventh degree black belt was shook down by the mob, literally like being forced into the back of cars driven around the waterfront guys are showing up at his house like steven seagal not so tough when yeah we would learn one of the individuals that was arrested was a made guy called primo casarino casarino was uh, a, an intermediary of chaconi he was involved with this guy called nasso that was his last name this julian nasso guy who was i guess involved in some sort of movie project with steven seagal something would happen where he, I guess, feel, felt that Seagal screwed him out of money. So this Nassau guy goes to his brother who knew Casarino, and they attempt to extort Mr. Seagal. So they don't that, attempt. They do. Seagal paid. Yeah, right. So this would all come out in the um, kind of 302s that Casarino provided, uh, and this would kind of move up to Chacon. And Chacon actually had talked about at one point that they went to a movie premiere uh, for mm -hmm. Steven Seagal. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting uh, kind of indictment that we don't talk about much in the mob, but this was an interesting indictment for sure. Richard Gotti ultimately wouldn't do a ton of prison time for his involvement. Keep in mind, he really just acted as a courier money wise for the family uh, in this case. In 2005, though, the Gotti name was becoming pretty much nothing in the streets. Gotti was senior was dead. Junior was out of the life. Uh, and. Uh, had by this point committed a proffer session, which we've talked about. Uh, and in 2005 as well, Peter is away. So the Gotti family is rid from, from name, right? They're gone. And the boss is now Arnold Squatiri, and he's kind of taken them through those rough waters, and they're now a totally different family. So the goal, I think, of the, the family was, let's eliminate these clowns and get them out forever. Yeah, they 2005, 
Yeah. Go ahead. They want to distance themselves from the Gotti name. The Gotti name did nothing but bring prison sentences and, and eyes from law enforcement. Right. So in 2005, what do you do to a family member that you don't want to deal with anymore? Um, who doesn't have a leg to stand on? You shelve them. Uh, and that's essentially what happened to Richard Gotti. Now, by this point, Richie Gotti had a son, Richie Gotti. He was also becoming involved. And we'll talk about him in a little bit as well. But Richard Gotti, we wouldn't hear from for a long time. He would move to a place in Pennsylvania called Milford. Now, if you know anything about the Gotti family, they for long periods of time had property in Milford. John Sr. would go there regularly. It was like a Pocono Mountain kind of getaway, if you will. Richard Gotti moves to Milford, PA, which is in Pike County, up near the New York line or New Jersey line. In 2012, though, his name would turn up in the Pike County Courier, which is pretty interesting, a little newspaper out there. According to the Pennsylvania State Police, in 2012, a woman would call to report that she had been beaten and choked in her home. Police would go to the scene. This was the home of Richard Gotti. Now, she would allegedly say that um, he beat her up and then took her to urgent care and she called the police. Now, nothing is ultimately known about what would happen to Richard Gotti with this, but this was reported in paperwork. He'd be charged with assault and things like that. Uh, according to what I know, Richard Gotti is still alive and he is 80 years old. As far as what he does now, he ain't in the mob. Just know that. <laughs> uh, his last name is Gotti. That's about it. Now, I have heard... Um, certain members of the family that are on YouTube uh, that I've talked about before uh, mentioned that one of them live in Milford as well. So whether they communicate still with some of the other members of the family, I don't know. The problem that the Gaudis have is they're constantly under still law enforcement scrutiny. So um, they have to be careful because they can't really cross the street, particularly the men of the family the right way. So from what I've kind of begun to find out, I think a lot of them are estranged from each other from what I'm gathering. I'm sure there's still maybe a relationship occasionally, but um, I don't believe like they have a big Thanksgiving dinner and they all show up and hang out. I, I don't I mean, what are you going to do? Talk about the good old days. Yeah. It's kind of a weird situation. I, I'm always curious because, you know, I find it hard to believe that John Jr. is going and having dinner with Richie Gotti. Like, I don't think that's it's happening. Good. I can't see it. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing, but he is still alive. The um, third uh, oldest brother. Uh, the fourth oldest brother uh, is Gene Gotti. Now we don't have a ton on Gene, but I went ahead and was able to find some pretty good info on him. Gene was born in 1946 and he was actually the first Gotti brother to be made. A lot of people don't know that Gene would become very involved right out of the gate with his brother, John, who was six years older than him. By 1966, he and John are both associated with the Fatico crew in East New York. They're very involved in hijacking. In fact, in 1969, Gene is arrested for interstate hijacking and gets a short prison sentence. Um, he would also do some other light sentences in the state prison system. By 1976, he becomes a made man. He's one of the first people in involved with inductions after the books are opened in the mid to late seventies. Now down the road, his brother, John would get uh, inducted as well. As we know, the only reason John wasn't inducted before Gene was, is because John was in prison. So he got the nod over, he over his brother, which is kind of interesting. I never, I actually never knew that. I always thought it was John first, but yeah, you think Gene so. was actually uh, inducted first. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. It's like you said, you always think about John first, but yeah, John would have been John would have been away in '76. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess it makes sense that Gene's the guy on the street there. Do you think he would ever hold it over John's head that he was made before him? I sure as hell hope not. <laughs> Probably wouldn't be very good for him if he did. Yeah, um, interesting the, that John was doing and what he was doing it for. You know what I mean? Like, right. Uh, we would find also some interesting things out about Gene. He wasn't just a drug dealer. He'd actually be very involved with Joe Scopo, who was a Colombo family heavyweight. They actually had a huge loan book on the street. They would meet hijacking when they were younger. And it was said at one point that they had more than a million dollars on the street. Now, remember, that's in the 
early 80s. I mean, that's a ton of fucking money on the street. And the good thing about loan sharking is you're making all profit. I mean, yeah. there's really no overhead in a loan sharking business. No, there's now, not. Envelopes. You probably have to pay a couple of people to, to hurt people if they don't pay. But generally, if you say my last name's Gotti, they're going to pay, particularly in the early 80s. Now, what we would know Gene Gotti for is his involvement with drug trafficking. And yep. a lot of that was done through a person called Mark Ryder. Mark Ryder was this Jewish drug dealer. So Gene and Johnny Corniglia and um, uh, Andrew Ruggiero were all selling heroin. Now, we don't have to go into the depths of Paul Castellano. We all know what happens. Paul finds out that they're selling drugs. We all know selling drugs is illegal under the Castellano regime. Uh, right. Deal and die. Absolutely. Jeannie would ultimately be arrested in 83 for selling heroin. He would also be arrested in separate cases with his brother that he would beat. The problem is he had that narcotics uh, trial hanging over him. Now, I want to talk about the indictment. Uh, that Gene Gotti was involved in because we would actually find out some pretty itch interesting information from wiretaps. In a June 1982 conversation, we can hear Angie Ruggiero and Gene Gotti talking directly about drugs. Ruggiero would respond, quote, I'm trying to figure out. I'm all confused. I just picked up eight things. Picked up six off them guys. Give one to, I'm giving one to Zeke tonight and one to Jew boy. Now, Zeke would be Arnold Squitieri, who was a major drug trafficker. He would ultimately become the boss of the family. Gene would respond, you got eight, question mark? Ruggiero, one more, yeah. Andrew would also say, I took two off Eddie and uh, Jew Boy ordered one. Now, Eddie would be Eddie Lino. We would also find out that in situations where the feds would bust people on things, they would find, uh, you know, Gene's name. They would find all sorts of stuff involving mm -hmm. Gene Gotti. Gene would face trial multiple times in this because there was mistrials. There was a it was a big problem with convicting them. They would ultimately, though, be convicted, Charlie Coniglia and Jeannie Gotti. And in July of 18, 1989, they would get 50 years in prison. Think about this, Blackjack. I was born in July 1989. So Gene Gotti ushered away to prison for 50 years, and Nadeau was born in July 1989. A good replacement uh, for society. What was that? A good trade for society. Exactly. You, you send one scoundrel off. You, you usher one in. Uh, so that's a long prison sentence, 50 years. You go see the judge, they say 50 years. It's a feds. You're going to do 40 of them probably. Feds weren't uh, fucking doing the drugs in the 80s, man. They're still not, yeah. but. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for Gene Gotti, we would see him, though, pop up. His brother would go see him. He was always trying to get news on the streets, things like that. Um, he wouldn't be released until 2018. He he only got out about four years ago. Uh it would ultimately do about 30-ish years in prison. That's a long time in the feds. I mean, that's most of your life. Half your life, you're in prison. Now, his name would weirdly pop up. And I've talked about the really disgusting journalism that we have nowadays. Gene Gotti's name would pop up after Frank Cali was killed in 2019. Mm -hmm. A lot of people believed it was some infighting involving the Gambino family. And Gene just got out, so... It had to be Gene. Uh, it was just really horrible journalism. And it's really just the New York Post, the New York Daily News trying to insert the Gotti name into exactly. the newspapers. Gotti uh, sells papers, brother. I mean, the idea that this guy is going to sit in a federal prison cell for 30 years, get out, and kill someone who he really has almost no relationship with is insane. Right. I think it was the clear thought of Gene just got out. He's old and decided, you know what? There's not nothing worth it in the street anymore. Um, you know, I have some money that I have saved probably. I'm sure they took care of him and and he just wanted to live with his family. I think that's all that we really found out. But it was just really pathetic journalism, I thought. Um, Gene Gotti's still alive and from what I understand just hangs out with his family. I, I don't believe he's on the streets of Brooklyn or Queens anywhere knocking around heads or anything. Um <laughs> But again, another person that is not associated with the mafia anymore with the last name Gotti. The fourth brother uh, is a guy called Vinny Gotti. He would be born in 1952, and he would grow up and spend all his life in Brooklyn. He never saw the Bronx. By this point, they had moved to Brooklyn. 
we would find out pretty early that Vinny Gotti was the real black sheep of the family. Uh, mm -hmm. And by his teenage years, he would be arrested in 1973 for petty theft and would develop a drug problem. And this would be a real issue for John Gotti Sr. If you know anything about John Gotti Sr., he, uh, quote, abhorred drug users. Yeah. So this was a bad thing for him. And we would know that certain members of his crew, Tony Rotrampino, had a drug problem. And, you know, he would, you know, he would always be very wary of, of a drug addict. You know, it's not great, Blackjack, when you're a gangster, you don't want a drug addict near what you're doing. No, it presents nothing but a threat. I mean, you know, first of all, like you just we were just talking about the the sentences for people who are even dealing in drugs, not not only using them, but just dealing them. The sentences are massive, which means it's more likely someone's going to flip because they're staring down the barrel of a giant number and the feds get them when it comes to drug charges. Then if you got people who are using the drugs, they're not reliable. You can't trust them. They're going to do some some wild card type shit because they're either high or looking to get high. It's just not something that works in an organization that really kind of requires some discretion. Absolutely. And kind of what it would lead to was John Gotti banned him from not only the Bergen Hunt Fish Club, but also the Ravenite Social Club. He was his brother, but he wasn't going to let him hang around. And he was by this point just kind of an associate, probably made a little money for the family. But According to what we know about Vinny Gotti, he had no legitimate source of income. Um, at one point, he would be listed as a shop steward in one of the union locals in New York City. At one point, he worked at the phone company, one of the phone companies. And in one court case, he would be called by his lawyer, quote, a homemaker, whatever that <laughs> means. Um, Vinny Gotti. I guess he took care of his home. His, his wife was the breadwinner, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Vinny Gotti, the house husband. Now, we would find out that Vinny Gotti was a great father and participated in baseball games and charity events and all those things. But, um, you know, and I'm sure by this point he had cleaned up his drug habit. He lived in Long Island, but he really had no legitimate source of income. And then by 2002, the government uh, would allege that he would actually be made. He would become a made member of the family after, you know, I guess he had no other prospects and decided, you know what, I'll start hanging around again. John's dead. Uh, I'll go do my thing and they need members. So I'm sure Peter will let me in. He lets everybody in. Um, and tough. he would, yeah, he'd become a member. It was that simple. It's kind of crazy. We wouldn't hear much about Vinny Gotti until 2008 when he's involved in the big indictment called Old Bridge. Now, Old Bridge was this 80 count indictment, 50 Gambino family members are indicted. Jackie D'Amico, Jojo Carrazzo, Charles Carnegie. Uh, I mean, all, all sorts of people. Vinny Gotti's name would pop up in a bizarre shooting case. Now, now think about this, guys. This is a wild case. Bajic, have you heard about this case? Do you know what happened here? I, I don't know the, the, the details on it. Um, it's I mean kind of wild. L listen to this. So, the feds would allege in May of 2003, I guess Vinny Gotti was dealing with this guy called Angelo Mognolo. Mognolo was a Howard Beach bagel store owner. I guess Vinny goes to him and says, hey, I got a business opportunity. Do you want to go in on it with me? Mognolo kind of says, no, I don't. Vinny Gotti becomes very annoyed with this, makes up some bullshit argument that this Magnolo guy is carrying on an affair with his wife <clears throat> and instructs his nephew, Richie Gotti, the son of Richard Gotti, to shoot Magnolo. He would attempt to shoot him three times, but he wouldn't kill him and the guy would survive. Is that not a wild story? It's it's a, it's so bizarre that like you would not only risk the murder rap, you would embroil your nephew in this, which is an interesting strategy. And you're doing this in in what 2005, like of a civilian. Like that's not the shit that the mob does. Now luckily Magnolo would survive, but this was just a random stupid decision from a guy who didn't seemingly have all of his marbles. Now for Gotti and his nephew, they would both be hit with attempted murder, conspiracy to commit murder. 
and both got eight years in 2008. Like his brother, Richie Gotti, Vinny Gotti would also be shelved, as far as I know, and he is no longer a part of the family either. I want to leave you with comments that were said by George Gabriel, who uh, was a FBI agent. In a 1992 interview about Vinny Gotti, George Gabriel would say, quote, Vincent has no place within the family organization. He was chased away as an embarrassment due to his stupid things he had done in his past. So that was pretty much John knew right away that his brother was an idiot and he should never be around the family. But by 2002, they were so hard up for members that they were making anybody. I mean, when you sit back and look at the, the brothers Gotti, it wasn't a great run for the Gambino family. I mean, John obviously had his his heights that, you know, he was able to achieve. But on the whole, the Gottis are, are just a cancer on the Gambino crime family. No, they really were. I mean, you have two brothers that were shelved uh, because they were basically embarrassments. You had one who no one. In prison. Yeah, right. 30 years in prison, really wasn't around much. Probably had a decent ceiling on him, but he never really was able to because he was in jail. And then you have John Jr., who famously quit the mafia. Right, right. And no one really respected either. No. So, and and listen, whether you like Sammy Gravano or not, he said it best. I mean, those guys had no business in, in the mafia. They just shouldn't have. They shouldn't have been anywhere near it. But we've seen this time and time again as we get closer and closer to the 2000s and past the 2000s, you're making people that are issues. They're going to be problems. And then they all cooperate and you say, well, what happened here? Well, maybe we didn't do our due diligence and shouldn't have ever involved them with the mafia. That was probably the best idea. So all in all, you have five brothers involved with the mafia. You have John Sr., you have Peter, Gene, Vinny, and Richie. Five brothers. There was, though, Blackjack, one brother we don't talk about. Yeah, I'm curious about this one. I think a lot of people will be. His name was Bill Gotti. A lot of people <laughs> don't know that. William. All right. And from what I understand, he would be called the good one out of the family. He would initially decide very early that he didn't want that for his life. He had watched not only his brothers, but his family, particularly his father, who was kind of an absentee father, and remember, Billy Gotti was the second youngest. He didn't know the Bronx. He didn't necessarily know poverty, maybe like the others did. He was a little older, or they were a little older than he was. I think he kind of realized, you know what, I'm going to do something different with my life. As a child, he would actually work at a deli in Brooklyn and eventually take that deli over. He developed a very big interest in cooking. He enjoyed uh, culinary stuff. He would actually go to college and at one point work on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, but in the 1970s, he decided, you know what? I'm getting out of here. I'm going away. He would move to L.A. and would begin working at a very famous deli called Greenblatt's in Hollywood. And it's a very famous Jewish deli. Um, he would eventually gain enough gumption to open his own restaurant called Victor's Square Deli. And from what I understand... Anybody that went there, I read some reviews and stuff, said it was terrific. He offered all sorts of Jewish and Italian culinary dishes, uh, you know, the matzo ball soup and all that stuff, cold cuts. Yeah. Um, people love the food. According as well to something I heard, he actually spoke Yiddish. A lot of people, that's pretty that's interesting, true. you know, to communicate with his family. Yeah. Um, and he communicated with the family that he had in the restaurant that would come in and see him. And as we know, a lot of Jewish people in L.A. There's a lot of very powerful Jewish people. In LA. You had a lot of New York transplants in L.A. too. So, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, eventually, though, he would lose the restaurant due to some financial difficulties. And he would begin a charity where he would help homeless people in L.A. So he's actually a pretty a good guy. He would actually have a son called Bill as well. Uh, and sadly, in 2018, he was beaten up, the son, uh, by uh, several unnamed homeless people. I guess it was just a very random incident. But um, he never would really comment on his family. I think at one point I heard a quote that he had about, you know, just because your family is involved with stuff, you don't need to be. and uh, You can go and create your own path in life. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he did. From what I know, he is still alive. I don't know what he's up to now, but um, – 
Yeah. I actually spoke to um, Mikey Scars. You know Mikey Scars. Mm -hmm. He actually told me that John mentioned his brother Bill several times, but it was very brief. He just said that he had another brother and that was it. Nothing was I'm really ever said. To know what, I'd be curious to know what John's thoughts were on his brother living his life that way. Because on the one hand, you think like maybe you'd be happy for him. I feel like John Gotti probably looks down on that. No, no. I, I always am curious about like what is what did John Gotti think about very like normal things? Like what did he think about church? What did he think about like people that didn't want to be in the mafia? I don't know. I get a feeling though like I know we talk about John Sr. and like this – you know, he's kind of an asshole kind of way of thinking because he was. I mean, but there were probably things about John Gotti that he did enjoy. And, I, you know, I'm going to disagree. I think he probably said, you know what? Good for him. You know, I hope, I he, hope he did. You know, he's my brother. I hope he I hope he does and, okay. Listen, we've talked about John Gotti on this show a lot. I mean, as much as anybody else. I I have a soft spot for the guy because I think that John Gotti is a guy that you wouldn't want to do business with necessarily – but I'd love to be his neighbor. I think he'd be a great fucking neighbor, okay? Like, the people in, in Howard Beach loved John Gotti. And, you know, he was he was a, a good guy in some ways. People are complex, you know? Everyone wants to make these broad generalizations these days. Oh, the guy's a gangster. He's a bad guy. He's this, he's that. Yeah, he did bad things. But you know what? He also loved his family. He loved his kids. You know, he took care of people that were close to him. You can be multidimensional in life, people. Everything's not a square box. It was funny, though, because he always did talk very negatively about people, right? He would always yeah. talk like he, he called Peter an imbecile. He called his son an imbecile. He called I mean, Jeff. I think part of that is just the culture. Like, I mean, I, I've told you we've talked about on the show. My, my father grew up in, in New York City, spent most of his life there until he moved out to Long Island when he was older. Like, that's how he talks. My father, if he's not insulting you, it's, he doesn't really care. Right. Yeah, it's funny. I, you know, and then I heard him call like Richard Gotti, his brother. He called him a pee pee brain, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> I guess that just means like he's a dumbass, basically. I guess, I guess, but, man. I but guess. um, you no, know, he would even talk down to like his grandson. You remember, remember yeah, that, remember that. Liar town? like when he said he wanted to be a baseball player. Yeah, he's like, you, you know, you got to take steroids. Can? You must take steroids. You know, yeah. like, yeah, he he basically just knocked the kid down, right? You know, he sure like, did. He just didn't care, you know. An interesting approach from Grandpa sitting in a jumpsuit in Marion. Yes, yes. Um, but all in all, a very interesting group of people, I'll say. I, I will always say about the Gotti family, they're very interesting human beings. I mean, they just are. Um, I will say this to answer your question a minute ago. When you said you often wonder what John Gotti would think about things, I think you can just say to yourself, how does Donald Trump feel about it? Because I feel like they're the same person. Essentially. Yes, I, I do get that. I agree, but that's a very if interesting. John Gotti was still alive and didn't go to prison. I feel like John Gotti could have been president in this day yeah. and age. It doesn't matter. No, I don't think it'd been out of the question. I, I, I think you're kind of onto something there. Um, I do want to mention um, one of the really. I always found this conversation with Gotti and his brother to be very interesting because we saw a side of Gotti that I don't think I've ever seen before. Do you know where I'm going with this? No, I don't. I just I just had a thought. I'll follow it up in a second. Go ahead. No, go ahead. What's your thought? I just thought, no, he wouldn't have been president. He would have been Donald Trump's choice to lead the FBI. Because I could hear Trump saying, who knows the FBI better than John Gotti? Could you imagine? Wow. Unbelievable. Tell me, tell me I'm wrong. Actually, a funny scene I think about. Um, yeah, because who better knows the FBI than him? That's a good Nobody point. knows the FBI better than John Gotti. Right. Um, we would find a softer side of Gotti, though. And this is one thing about him that we finally saw some emotion from him, right? At one point in a, in a conversation, it would happen in January of 1998. And, and I'm reading directly from the, the words that we have from this conversation. Peter and John are sitting there. There's no one else there. It's just him and them two alone. And Peter asked John about, you know, have you talked to so-and-so? He mentions a woman's name called Rosemary. And John talks about, yeah, you know, she, she writes me. Her daughter won't leave me alone. Right. And you begin to wonder who's he talking about. Now, Rosemary is a woman that was dating Neil De La Croce. It was his longtime uh, mistress. She had a daughter called Shannon. Okay. 
John allegedly struck up a relationship with her extramaritally, right? Yep. They begin hooking up. Supposedly she has a child. And in this conversation, John directly talks about the fact that, hey, have you seen the kid? She's a precious little kid, you know? And Peter makes the comment, she looks just like me, basically. Like, she looks like him and his brother. Yeah, right. Essentially saying that she's John's well, her father. Him. Right. So this is kind of the conversation. When you see the other person again, that Rosemary, he began, that daughter annoys me with these fucking letters and cards. She thinks you're like boyfriend and girlfriend again. Notice the word again. You know what I mean? You tell her, listen, I don't know if you know who he is or what he is, but he's a busy guy, this guy. But he knows his obligations. He tries to meet his obligations and all that. In his heart, he feels what he's supposed to do in his heart. She's disappointed. Where does she think this fucking money grows? You got to tell her. After Peter responds that he has told her that in the past and assures his brother he will again, John Gotti spells out his plan of action for Pete to get them to stop asking for money. John responds, quote, first of all, you are willing to write to a guy. It's a holiday for him to get out of his cell for an hour of comfort. You're in and you're out. You'll write feeling sorry for yourself at the time. You feel sorry for you too. Let her show you one of my letters to her. I feel great. I never felt better in my life. I feel like a youngster. I wish you the best. We'll try and help you with your problem. And then he kind of nods into like this whole, hey, um, with a smile, he says to his brother, did you see Rosemary's granddaughter? Cute kid, eh? Good kid. She looked like I told you. Peter responds, yeah, I thought she was my daughter or a bigger version of my granddaughter. She's a nice kid. It looks like they're bringing her up right. Gotti responds, I guess so. The mother's all right, but she's kind of a pee-pee brain. <laughs> he loves that so, one. And, and, and basically roundabout what he's saying is his obligations are the fact that he fathered a child out of wedlock and it's yeah. likely her. OK, and Peter essentially confirms it and says, yes, she looks like us. She looks like your daughter. She looks like my daughter. We look the same. So I've never really heard John Gotti speak in those ways like, oh, you know, looks like they're raising her right. It seems almost that he's sad that he can't be involved in her life because of the family that he already has. Now, I want to make this clear. No one in the Gotti family has ever confirmed this, nor will they. They don't no. want anybody to know this. No. Now, Miss Grillo is a grown woman now and lives her own life. And her mother's never really commented on it either. The problem that her mother has is she was married to a Gambino soldier, Ernie Grillo. Mm -hmm. And John Gotti yet again broke another rule for having sex with a fucking mob made guy's wife and got her knocked up. Yes. So there you go. A little paternity suit, Mari yes. style. So, yes, that was the one side when we talk about Gotti, you know, kind of a soft side. Yeah. And if we had it with his kids, I mean, you know, he was he was he was soft on his kids. I want you to do me a favor here. And, and we're not going to put it on the screen because, you know, we're just not going to do that. But um, have you ever seen the daughter? Have you ever seen what she looks like? I have not. I, I mean, I got to be honest, dude. Like she looks a lot like him. So What's your if first you name? ever get a shot, I guess look her up sometime. Shannon Grillo is her name. Um, but that's common knowledge. A lot of people know that. But um, Blackjack, very interesting family nonetheless, aren't they? Um, there's they no body fine. member in the mafia anymore. They're all gone. They're all shelved. Some are alive, but they're not in the mafia anymore. So They're lucky to be alive and they're lucky to be free because the FBI and the U.S. Department of Justice – had the biggest hard on they've ever had for anyone for the Gotti family. So, um, you know, they should count their blessings that they're all not locked up or in a grave. It's also funny. Last thing I'll say on this is we actually talked about a grandson of John Gotti that was involved with the mafia as well in a interview we did with Gene Barello, former Bonanno associate. Blackjack, he talked to very openly the fact that in like 2012, 2013, the kid he called Little Gotti, who was the grandson of John Sr., Peter's kid, John's son Peter, the, the bigger guy, he had a son called John uh, V. Gotti, the, the, the fourth or whatever. And the kid was a fucking hellion. He was running around, lighting cars on fire, robbing banks, all sorts of shit. 
he was actually selling drugs out of Gotti Sr.'s home. <laughs> Got eight years in prison for it. So he was involved with the mob as well. Wasn't a made guy, but who's to say what he'll be when he gets out? But he, Gene Barella would talk about in the interview that this kid would always mention that he was Gotti's grandson. And Barella would tell him, like, why are you telling me that? Like, the name is nothing in the streets now. They're nobodies now, right? He's, he's got a grandson that's an MMA fighter, right? He also, yes, has a son that, yeah, it's John's son, John yeah. Jr. Yeah. A very good fighter from what I understand. I think um, he's become a boxer. He does. I think he fought a month or so ago. It seems yeah. like a very uh, – and that's the thing about the Gotties. Like now, a lot of the grandkids seem like all right kids. You know, they're – yeah, they're they're all married. They have kids. I mean, remember the the three grandsons were on the the show growing up, Gotti. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like they're all now like grown up and like they have businesses together and stuff. So like, make that they name all kind of turned cool. out well. You know, pretty interesting family nonetheless. We couldn't talk about the mafia without them. Blackjack, it was good to see you. Good to talk to you. Um, I want everybody to follow Blackjack on Twitter at Blackjack Fletch. Uh, he is verified, and I don't think he paid for it either. Maybe he did. I don't know. I want to tell you, though, you know why I paid for it? I'm going to tell you right now why I paid for it. Because I want to control the content that I see. And I also want people to know it's me because there are fake accounts of Jeff Nadeau that I want to right. make sure you know That's that right. are not. There are, there are yeah. fake Nadeau accounts. There are. Yeah, you know that. So I did. Uh, Black, <laughs> it was good to see you. Uh, we're going to have to get you back soon uh, to do another Thank show. You. Uh, did you miss the sit-down people? Oh, I love it. The sit down's fun, man. The sit down used to be like my my hour of of fun a week. Yes, we've done a lot of good episodes. I mean, we did many episodes. Uh, if you ever want to hear the old episodes, guys, you can always go back and listen. If you if you're just catching us for the first time, we had a great month last month. We're we're killing it this month. I'm very proud of this show, and Blackjack was able to to really help us build it. So we're we're grateful for him, and I'm sure a lot of Barstool people will. Uh, be happy to see that you're doing okay. So um, good to see you. I hope everything's good. Go follow Blackjack on Twitter at Blackjack Fletch. You can see all the stuff he's got going on, uh, all the gambling stuff he's doing. And he's still got that cowboy hat on. What's that, a Stetson you got on there? Damn right it is, Nadu. The only fucking cowboy hat worth it. Um, right. This is the sit down. He is Blackjack Fletcher. I am Jeff Nadu. Uh, Blackjack, good to see you. Thanks for being on, man. Thank you, brother. Anytime. We'll see you all next week. As always, make sure you subscribe to the show. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button. And if you're watching or listening on iTunes or Spotify, leave us, leave me a review. Let me know what you think of the show. And make sure you follow us on Twitter at Sit Down Crime Pod. We'll see you next week here on this.